Okay, so this one, this one's tough, even for us. We're talking about Liam Payne, former One Direction, right? Gone way too soon, 31 years old. And it's after this fall from his hotel room balcony in Buenos Aires. You've probably seen the headlines by now, but uh, we're going to try to get a little bit deeper here, try to understand what happened. Yeah, it's one of those stories, you know, just heartbreaking. And and like you said, the cases are never simple. There's always a lot to, to kind of unpack. We're talking about police statements, eyewitness reports. There's even a leaked image out there, which just like adds another layer of I don't know, confusion to it all. But I think to even begin to try to make sense of any of this, we have to start with what we know, what's confirmed. Exactly. And what we know is that Liam was in Buenos Aires. He was staying at the Casu Palermo Hotel. It's a pretty nice hotel, kind of an upscale place in a really, you know, well to do part of the city. The thing is, there were two 911 calls made from the hotel in the hours before Liam's, uh, before his death. Mm -hmm. And I think those calls are really, really important to kind of piece together what happened. And those calls, I mean, they're they're chilling. I mean, the first one, it mentions that he might have been under the influence, even saying that he was, quote unquote, trashing the room. Yeah. And, you know, what's what's even more unsettling is who made the call. Yeah. So it was actually the hotel's chief receptionist. Right. Right. And they told the operator that at 5.01 p.m., they said, quote, when he is conscious, he is trashing the entire room and we need you to send someone, end quote. So, I mean, this this wasn't just a noise complaint, right? The hotel staff, they were really concerned. And that's even before that second call came in. And that second call, oh, man, even more frantic, right? Like, they even mentioned the balcony. And they're saying that his life could be in danger. And, and tragically, by the time emergency services even arrived, just minutes later, it was, it was already too late. And it just goes to show, right, how quickly things can go wrong. You know, reports, they place Liam's Fall somewhere between 42 to 45 feet. I mean, that's that's high. To put it into perspective, you're talking about a four-story building. That kind of fall, I mean, doesn't leave much of a chance. Which leads us to, like, okay, what was even going on in that room? And authorities did find a few things. I mean, near his body, they found some items in the courtyard. Right. So near his body, they find a whiskey bottle, a lighter, and um, and his cell phone. And I guess on the, or these things, they don't tell us a whole lot, but I think they definitely add to the picture that we're trying to, you know, put together here. And, and the room itself, it was described as being in total disorder. We're talking like broken items, furniture overturned. I mean, it, it really suggests that there might have at least been some sort of a struggle or the very least, like he was very agitated. Yeah. And I think that description becomes super important when we think back to the 911 calls. Because remember, they mentioned loud noises, right? Mm. And Leah maybe being distressed. So it, it kind of sounds like there was this this pattern, this escalating behavior in the hours before his death. Hmm. You know, it's almost like two timelines in a way. There's the external one with like the 911 calls, the emergency services arriving. And then there's this like internal timeline. What was actually happening inside that room? Exactly. You nailed it. Yeah. And to understand that that internal timeline, we got to look at what was found inside the room. And so we're talking like over the counter medications, energy packs. And and this is critical. The prescription medication. Clonazepam. And for our listeners who might not know Clonazepam, it's it's often used to treat anxiety. And so this is kind of where his past struggles, his history with anxiety and alcohol abuse kind of, it becomes, you know, relevant, right? right? It's easy to want to connect the dots, right? Yeah. To say, oh, well, because of his past, this is what must have happened. But we have to be careful about jumping to conclusions. You see, Clonazepam, when it's taken as prescribed, it's it's generally safe. But when you mix it with alcohol, its effects, they can they can increase. They can even be really dangerous. And we don't know if he was mixing anything. Exactly. That's where the toxicology reports, they're really, really important here. They'll give us a much better idea of what was actually in his system and if it played any role in his state of mind. But those results, they could take weeks. We don't have those yet. Yeah, it's a good reminder for all of us, right? I mean, we can speculate all we want, but until we get those hard facts, it's all it is. It's speculation. Exactly. That said, I mean, the autopsy itself, it does give us a few insights, even though it raises even more questions. Let's let's get into that. What did they find out about how he died? So the autopsy confirmed that he died from severe head injuries, which lines up with the fall from that height, you know. But here's the thing. There weren't any defensive wounds on his body. So meaning he didn't try to brace himself at all, which, I mean, in a fall like that, it's kind of strange. M makes you wonder, was he even like aware of what was going on? Million dollar question right there. I mean, yeah. 
was he even conscious when he went over? Was he intoxicated? Or was there something else going on that we haven't even considered? We need those toxicology results because that's going to be key to figuring out his state of mind right before, you know, in those final moments. It's like every piece of information we get just makes things more complicated. Yeah. And then there's this picture, right? This leaked image that's like all over the internet. And I know we don't want to, you know, make it seem like we're just trying to get attention with this but it's out there. It is. And because it's, you know, it's become public, we can't really just ignore it. So basically for those listening, imagine this photo and it looks like a hotel ring table, but it's a mess. I mean, there's crumpled up tin foil, a lighter and uh, a lot of white powder. It's not hard to, you know, see why people are jumping to conclusions. Right. People see that and like their minds go right to a certain place. And I totally get it. It's hard not to. But you keep saying we have to be careful here. And I and I think that's really important. <laughs> it's crucial. Yeah. Because here we got, like, we really got to think critically. This is a perfect example of that. Because all we have is this picture, right? With zero context. We don't know for sure it's even from his room or when it was taken. Or even if that stuff is actually what everyone's saying it is, you know? It just shows you, right, you can't believe everything you see online, especially with something like this. It can be really, really misleading. It really can. And the thing is, it can actually be harmful. Yeah. Because if this info is wrong, I mean, it could mess with the investigation. <laughs> right. right. And, and even worse, it can really hurt people who are already hurting, like his friends and family. It's a tough reality. Yeah. But I want to, like, kind of shift gears for a sec, because even with everything we've talked about, there are still so many questions like what was going on with all that noise, the stuff that people were hearing earlier in the day. Was that like part of what was happening with Liam or was it something else complete? That's one of the big ones for sure. And then there's another thing. Was he alone in that room or was someone else there with him? We don't know. And those are things that really need to be looked at. And, and maybe this is just me, but I can't help but think about like, why do these stories, especially when it's someone young who seems like they had everything figured out, why do they get to us so much? It's a good question. And there are probably a lot of reasons. Part of it might be that we realize it can happen to anyone. Like even if someone is super successful, they can still be struggling. Or maybe it's that we just need to try to make sense of these things because the world can feel really chaotic sometimes. Maybe it's a little of both. I don't know. But I just keep thinking about empathy. Like, yeah, we have all these headlines, all these theories. But at the end of the day, he was a real person. He had people who loved him. And he was super talented, and now he's just gone. That's what we have to remember. It's easy to get caught up in the drama, the gossip, but we got to come back to that, to empathy. Try to understand, not judge. Maybe that's how we find some meaning in all of this. And maybe even honor him, like by actually talking about mental health, the pressure that comes with, you know, being famous, and just how important it is to get help if you need it. 100%. We need these conversations mm -hmm. and we need to be kind to each other because it's so easy to look at someone like him, a huge star, and assume everything was perfect. But mental health, it doesn't care about any of that. It affects everyone. It's true. You just you don't know what's going on with someone, even if like from the outside, it seems like they have it all. Well, and it goes back to like we were saying before, right? You have to separate what you think happened from the actual facts. Right. We can look at the timeline and the evidence, but we'll never really know what was going through his head at the end. And maybe, maybe that's okay. Yeah. You know, maybe the biggest lesson in all of this is that we can't know everything. There are some things we just can't, you know, figure out. And with these kinds of things, you need to be like humble. You have to realize it's complicated mm -hmm. and we may never get all the answers. So I guess, where does that leave us? We have this young guy, his life was cut short. His family and friends are going through something awful and, and people all over are trying to understand. But if there's one thing I hope people take away from all of this, from everything we've talked about, it's just be kind, have empathy for Liam, for everyone who cared about him and, and even for yourself, right? This is a lot to process. Couldn't have said it better myself. And if I could just add one more thing, let's use this, okay? Mm -hmm. Use this to think about ourselves, to talk to the people we care about. Let's actually have real conversations about mental health and the stuff we deal with. And let's just be there for each other. No judgment. We'll probably never understand exactly what happened to Liam, but maybe, just maybe, we can learn something from all this yeah. and hopefully create a world where nobody feels like they have to go through these things alone. That's a that's a really good point. And to everyone listening, thanks for, you know, thanks for being here with us for this. It's it's a tough one, but it's important. Just remember, choose empathy. Choose compassion. 
and be there for each other, especially when things get rough. 